but de Havilland had taken a bold leap into the future with the Comet, and they were years ahead of the competition. In 1949, the Comet flew for the first time, and in 1952, it initiated the world's first pure jet scheduled passenger service. The Americans hadn't shown a great deal of interest in this eccentric British notion of jet transportation, but one American company realized that America was missing the boat by a mile, and they decided they wanted to build their own jet transport. It was the Boeing Corporation. The British-built Comet had pioneered the era of passenger jets in 1952, but by 1958, Boeing had built a jet that would send the Comet back to the tram sheds. And this is it, the Boeing 707. Four engines in pods, underslung under a swept back wing. Its granddaddy was the B-47 bomber, its daddy was the B-52. If airliners were racehorses, the Comet would be a nice little filly. This, on the other hand, would be a dirty great stallion. It's twice the weight, it carries twice the passenger load. It goes further, it goes faster than the Comet. This thing is just a beast. And to prove it, Chief Test Pilot Tex Johnson did a barrel roll in it on its first public outing. The Boeing top brass almost choked on their martinis, but it did make a point. Everybody wanted to fly in the 707. John F. Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy, wanted to fly in one so badly, he bought his own. This one, Air Force One, the very first Air Force One. Mrs. Kennedy said, why don't we paint it blue? And so they did. The 707 was huge. Where the Comet 1 carried 36 passengers, you could fit 110 Midwesterners in this plane if it wasn't full of the paraphernalia of politics. This is the Oval Office in the sky. And on this very seat have sat Kennedy, uh, LBJ, Ford, uh, Nixon, Carter, and Reagan. This table actually goes up and down on hydraulic rams so that the president could intimidate the person in front of him, or not, as the case may be. Henry Kissinger was so fond of it, he once got stuck underneath it. Some of the most critical decisions in the world, feeling the flush of victory, the chain of command, have been taken on this very throne. And in the unlikely event of a nuclear attack, secret codes will be found in the safe in front of you. Damn, what was that number? America's first production model, jet transport, comes off the assembly line. Boeing reckoned their 707 would cost $16 million to develop, but by the time the plane was ready to fly, they'd coughed up a mind-blowing $185 million. That was more than the company was worth. They were betting their shirts and their bank manager's shirt on the success of this plane. Pan Am were the launch customers for the first 707s, and in 1958, before they'd even got the keys, they boasted in a big ad campaign they'd be the first to provide a transatlantic passenger jet service. But just three weeks before the big day, the Brits got there first. A BOAC extended range Comet 4 flew London to New York carrying the world's first transatlantic jet passengers. Britain 2, USA, nil. They were obviously a bit miffed that we beat them to it. Yeah. I know there was a great deal of, of, of rivalry in aviation. Of course there was. A lot of money involved, a lot of nations involved. But the fact remains is the British did win the battle. But unfortunately, the Comet lost the war. It had pioneered jet transport, but with a deadly flaw. Flying at higher altitudes than a prop plane, with greater changes in pressure, it suffered unexpectedly severe metal fatigue. Some of the early models were simply ripped apart in midair, with tragic consequences. Over 500 people lost their lives in a total of 20 crashes. Though only eight of these disasters were attributed to aircraft failure, it was enough to seal the comet's fate 
and put Britain out of the transatlantic jet race for a decade. The mighty 707 went on to dominate the airline industry. Over 1,800 were built in its various forms, and some of those planes are still flying commercially for airlines in Latin America and Africa. I want to find out what getting airborne in this flying legend is all about. You're out of uniform currently. But since I don't fancy flying Air Botswana, Major Jeff Dalrymple has agreed to take me on as his latest recruit for the US Air Force's 100th Bomb Group, AKA the Bloody Hundreds. You see, the military bought the 7072, 820 of the things. In fact, they were the original customer, but they didn't want seats. They installed massive fuel tanks, painted them gray, and dubbed them the KC-135. This particular jet was built in 1962, so it's 42 years old. Wow. I was four years old when this airplane <laughs> was born. And over the years, they've made constant upgrades, including these oversized engines. If you look at the, uh, the clearance of the engine here, uh, depending on the weight of the aircraft, it can be as, as little as 18 inches of clearance. Yeah. Uh, so very high possibility in a crosswind situation, you could scrape a pod here and have that uh, be a lot of damage to the so jet. This is, this is a 737 engine, basically. Yes, the exact same engine as a 737, uh, just outfitted for our jet. Uh, these engines were redone in 1985 and basically doubled the thrust available for our, for our aircraft. Yeah, it's 22,000 pounds an engine. Yep. We've got the boom siding window here. These 15 tankers from the 100th Air Refueling Wing do all the air-to-air -air refueling for NATO planes between Norway and South Africa. That's over 20 million square miles of sky. Boeing 707, KC-135 tanker. And it's the best seat in the house. Well, almost. With a stonking headwind and those massive new engines at full chat, with all the fuel we're carrying, she's still only climbing at 1,200 feet a minute. Um, what's this airplane like, as opposed to the original 707? They've been continually upgrading this plane, whether it be the engines they put on 85, or back in about 97 when they started with the glass cockpit. Uh, with all the upgrades and all the... Uh, the new, the new gadgets and bells and whistles on it, they expect this, pl this plane to fly all the way through at least in 2020, maybe 2030. This could be a 60 to 70 year old aircraft when the Air Force is done with it. The fact that these old birds are still doing such a crucial job for the US military tells you something about how well they were built. The US Air Force paid Boeing 3.7 million for each KC-135 back in 1957. Today, it values them at 52 million apiece. Despite all the new kit, underneath its gray paint beats the heart and creaking control cables of a 40-year-old 707. They didn't see any necessity to upgrade the flight controls to make it a bit easier for you to pull it around. I, I wish. Uh, in, my, in my experience, this, this plane is a blast to fly, very fun because it's so hands-on, because it takes a challenge. You know, most aircraft have an assist from the autopilot during all phases of flight. You know, we don't have auto throttles. We don't have any of that. So this takes some old-fashioned stick-and-water skills that, you know, pilots back in the 50s had to use. <laughs> 